You've built an application, you've tested it, you're pretty convinced it does what you need it to do and the users will like it. You roll it out to the users. And then inevitably, you'll sit back and wait for things to go wrong. And these aren't necessarily things that go wrong because you coded the application incorrectly. The simple fact is that no matter how well you plan and no matter how well you write your code, things go wrong at runtime. Sometimes it's because of the computer. Sometimes the network connection goes down. Perhaps the user is writing to a CD and the CD burner is not working, or the disk has already been written to. So there are things that go wrong at runtime that didn't go wrong when you were testing. So your goal is to trap these exceptions and to handle them appropriately. Because if you don't handle them, then the execution of the program stops and the user's faced with the issue of trying to figure out what happened, which will usually mean they'll call you or the support desk. In .NET, error handling is based on the exception class. The exception class contains information about the current error and also contains a linked list of errors, keeps track of which methods or classes you called, and therefore where in your stack of code the error occurred. You can inherit from the exception class and create your own custom exception handling. Built into the .NET Framework classes are the ability to raise exceptions to indicate error conditions. So when issues occur, the classes will let you know. You can nest exception handlers, so you can have a higher level exception handler and then within that, more specific handlers. And this makes it easy to handle errors in a higher level method or in the methods that that method calls. The basic building blocks of exception handling in .NET are the try, the catch, and the finally block. You'll put some code in a try block, so you'll try and run some code. If it succeeds, great. If it causes an exception, then you'll catch or handle that exception. And there you'll write code to do something. Typically, this will be display some instructions to the user and keep the program from ending. And then in the finally block, you can run any cleanup code that's needed. For example, to shut down a database connection or to release any resources you're using. If you're coming to .NET from VB6 or converting a VB6 application into .NET, be aware that you can use both the VB6 style on error go to and the .NET style try catch in the same project not in the same procedure, but in the same project. Exception handling is built into the .NET framework, and there is a default exception handler at work. So you don't have to write your own code to handle exceptions. You can rely on the .NET runtime to handle exceptions. When an error occurs, the .NET runtime will look in the method that ran that code to see if there's an exception handler. If not, it will start working its way back up the stack to see if the code that called that has an error handler, and if the code that called that has an error handler. If no error handler is found, the .NET runtime will handle the error itself and provide you some information as to what went wrong. So if you don't handle errors yourself, the .NET runtime will handle them for you, but in all likelihood you want to include your own exception handling to handle the errors more gracefully or in the style that you want. So let's go see a demo of some code. We'll investigate some of the ways exceptions can occur, and then we'll see what happens. I have the sample application running. And let's see some examples of exceptions. In the first example, no error handling, we'll see what happens if we don't trap for errors ourselves. All of the examples that we'll use here are going to try and open a file on the disk. And throughout the course of the demos, we'll try to open files that don't exist or on drives that don't exist. We'll explore many of the exceptions that can be raised when you're working with files. So first, we're going to take a look at the getFileName method that will prompt the user for what file 
is to be opened. Let's step into that. And we're going to display on the screen some information to the user. Enter a file name. If the user presses enter, then we'll just use test.txt on the A drive, which for our purposes here is always guaranteed to fail. We'll use console.writeline to retrieve what the user enters. So here I'm just going to press enter and accept the default. We'll step out of here and now file name is test.txt on the A drive. Then we'll use an instance of the file class to open that file and we'll see if it works. Well, there is an A drive in this computer, but there's no floppy disk in it with a text.txt file on it. And because there's no floppy drive in here, there's an exception. We get an IO exception, which is unhandled, meaning we didn't do anything in our code to handle it. And the message is the device is not ready. So we see here that without writing any code ourselves, we do have built-in exception handling. This error is handled by the .NET framework. Now at design time, this is interesting information. The device isn't ready. And we know that we're trying to open a file on the A drive. So as developers, we have some information here we can use. But let's go see what happens when the users run this application. We'll stop this. And we'll go find executable file. The code's in the demos directory. This is exception handling. And the output directory is bin debug. And here's the executable file. So let's run this from the user's perspective. Say no error handling. We'll accept the default. And the user gets this message. This is the message the .NET runtime will show to the user. You can debug, but what are you going to do here? If the user had access to the source code, maybe they could debug, but of course they're not going to. And then you may have seen, as the console window disappeared, a lot of text. So at design time, if you don't handle errors, the .NET Runtime Exception Handler will handle the exceptions for you and more often than not provide you with the information you need. So as a developer, maybe you're okay without error handling, but to the users, that's not really acceptable. The user gets no useful information and all they know is the application's broken. They'll call the help desk, the application's broken, I got some error, I don't know what happened. So let's add some error handling to this application. We scroll down to the very bottom of this file. We see the basic building blocks of exception handling. The try, the catch, the finally. So the basic structure will be, you'll have a try block, and inside that try block, you'll run some code. You hope this code runs, but there's a possibility that it'll cause an error. If an error occurs, the catch block catches or handles that exception. And then inside the catch block, you'll have code to do something about it, which will typically be displaying a message to the user with some explanation as to what happened and what they should do next. You can also throw the exception back out to the calling code, and we'll look at that later. And then finally, if necessary, you can have code in the finally block to perform any cleanup code you need. So now let's run this application again and let's see an example of some simple catching of exceptions. I'll run the simple catch example and this time we'll enter a file that exists. Oh, let's say autoexec.bat. Come in here and we try and open that file, and it succeeds, 
We're then going to find the size of the file, which is in the length property, and display that to the user here, and then close the file. Great, that worked. Let's run. Good, that worked. Let's try another one. Now we'll accept the default, a colon backslash test.txt. This will fail because there's no floppy disk in the A drive. And now, rather than program execution halting, we catch the exception and we run the code in the catch block. And in this case, we're providing the most simple information we can, which is that an error occurred. So the good news here is the program hasn't stopped running. Of course, we probably want to provide additional information, but this is good for our purposes here. Let's try another example. Now, I'll try to open a file that doesn't exist. The C drive exists, but this file does not. We come in once again, we try and open the file. When that fails, we drop down into the catch block, and we display the same error message. Some error occurred. So what you've seen in this demo is that if you don't provide any error handling at all, the .NET runtime will catch the errors for you. At design time, that's fine because it gives you useful information and shows you the line of code that failed. You can then figure out what happened. At runtime, it doesn't really give the users any useful information, and in fact, it leads them sort of down the wrong path, which is telling Microsoft or trying to debug source code they don't have access to. So a better option is to use try-catch blocks. In the try block, you try and run some code, and if it causes an exception, that exception gets caught, and the code in your catch block runs. So that's the basic structure of exception handling. And in the rest of this section, we'll see how you can figure out what exception occurred, and therefore how you can display more useful information. Well, so far we've looked at handling exceptions in a single method. In the try block, we tried to open a file, and then in the catch block, we had code to catch an exception if the file couldn't be opened. Well, what happens if you have a method that calls another method that calls another method, and the exception could occur anywhere along that stack? Who handles the errors? Well, the answer is that the .NET runtime will look up the call stack until it finds code to handle the errors. So for example, so in this example, in the try block, we call the procedure A, which then calls the procedure B, and in procedure B, we call the procedure C, which attempts to open a file. Well, let's say the file can't be found. That causes an exception. Well, there's no error handling in procedure C, so the .NET runtime looks in B. Well, there's no error handling in B, so the runtime looks in A. There's no error handling in A, so the runtime looks in the code that called A. And there, there's a catch block, and so the code in that catch block runs. If there was no catch block there, then the .NET runtime would handle the message itself. In the previous demo, we handled an exception and displayed a generic message, an error has occurred but we'll probably want to be more specific than that. There's a lot of information related to errors, and the .NET framework keeps track of this information. To get access to it yourself, you can use the exception class. An exception class provides methods and properties you can use to report on the errors. So for example, if you call exception to string, that returns the name of the exception, a description of the exception, and a stack dump. A stack dump is basically a list of the methods that have run. So for example, you have a method that calls another method that calls another method that caused an exception. The stack dump will give you the ability to see which method the exception occurred in and then how you got to that point. 
The message property of the exception returns the actual error message. And you can use the inner exception to return another instance of the exception object. And this is useful when you want to nest exceptions and be able to walk the chain, if you will, of exceptions. Let's see a demo of how the .NET runtime searches through the methods that you've called for code that handles an exception. And then we'll also see a demo of how to use the exception object. I'm in the sample application. Let's run the error bubbling example. And here we're going to see what happens when you have methods that call methods that call other methods. And at some point, an exception occurs. So in the error bubbling method, in the try block, we're going to call the method A. Let's step into that. A calls the method B. And B calls the method C. And in C, work gets done. And here, we're going to try and open a file. We'll just accept the default, test.txt on the A drive and this will cause an exception. Now notice that we're now back in error bubbling. The exception occurred down in the method C. And what happens is the .NET runtime looks in C for code to trap the error. It doesn't find any, so it looks in B. It doesn't find any there, and it looks in A, and not finding any there, it finally comes back to the main method, error bubbling, and finds a catch block. And so the code inside that catch block runs, and we display that an error occurred. And you just need to be aware that even though the exception occurred in C, we wind up back in the main procedure. So any code in C that happened after the exception occurred will not run. Any code in B that occurred after the exception won't run. Same thing with A. The next line of code that runs is the code in the first catch block that's found. If there's no catch block found, then the .NET runtime will handle the exception. And we display that an error occurred. Well, so far we've been displaying a very generic error occurred message. Let's see how we can use the exception object to get more detailed information. I'll run the simple exception example. And for starters, we'll accept the default. We attempt to open the file. That fails. But now notice that the catch is a little bit different than before. Previously, we just had the word catch. Now, we're catching ex as exception. And what that says is when an exception occurs, create an instance of the exception class. We can, from here, call up the exception helper. But what we really want to do is create that instance of the exception class. And now that's the variable ex. The exception class provides quite a bit of useful information, including the message, the type of exception, this is an IO exception, and the stack trace. The stack trace is the record of how we got to this point. We started out in module1.vb on line 113. Then we called file.open, which returns an instance of the file stream class. So the file stream.init method ran. And then we got an IO error. So there's quite a bit of useful information in here. And we can decide in our code what we want to do with that. So for starters, let's just display the contents of the instance of the exception class. And we display the type of error, IO exception. That's the name property of the exception class. Here's the description. And here's the stack trace. Let's see another example. This time, we'll try and open a file that doesn't exist on the C drive. Now we get a file not found exception, not an IO exception. The description could not find the file. 
and the stack trays should be exactly the same. Let's try one last example. Let's open a file that does exist, but that we're not allowed to look at, pagefile.sys. Here we get an I.O. exception, but the message is that the process cannot access the file because it's being used by another process, which is Windows. So rather than display a generic message that some error occurred, you can use the exception class in your error handling to get more detailed information on the error that occurred. And then you can display some of that information. You could also write it to a log file if you wanted to. And that's a lot of information, and it's great to have access to. But you might want to just display something simpler to the user. So let's run the which exception example and see how we can do that. Once again, we'll try and open pagefile.sys, which will fail. And now, in the catch block, we're not going to display ex to string. We're just going to grab the message property of the exception object and display that to the user. So you have access to all of the information contained in the exception object, but by using the message property, you have an easy way to just display to the user the description of the error. So far, we've looked at a few types of exceptions. We saw a file not found exception. We saw an I.O. exception. The .NET framework provides a large number of exception classes. And each of them is intended to catch a specific type of error. The documentation for the classes in the .NET framework will tell you which errors might occur, and will show you which classes of exception will be called. So you'll want to use specific exceptions to handle different types of errors differently. And to do that, you can add as many catch blocks in your code as necessary. So far in the demos, we've used one catch block and trapped the basic exception object. You can add multiple catch blocks and specify that a particular block of code runs if a particular exception is found. The order that you have your catch blocks in code matters. You should put the most specific catch block first and the most general one last. This is because when an exception occurs, the runtime is going to look through your catch blocks and try to find a match against the current exception. And that checking occurs in the order that you have your catch blocks. And as soon as the runtime finds a match, it runs that code and exits. So let's say you have two catch blocks, one that's looking for an I.O. exception, and then one that's using the exception class. Well, the exception class is the base class for exceptions. An I.O. exception derives from that. So an I.O. exception is an exception. And if you're catching for exception first, then all exceptions that occur are going to be a match for that. And therefore, you'll never run the specific code in your catch block that's catching an I.O. exception. On the other hand, if you have I.O. exception first and exception after that, then if an I.O. exception occurs, that code will run. If any other exception occurs, then the code in your generic exception block will run. Let's go see a demo of how you can trap for a variety of exceptions. We've got the sample application up and running. Let's see an example of how we can trap for a number of exceptions. I'm going to run the multiple exceptions example. And I'll accept the default here, and we'll try and open a file on the A drive. This is going to cause an exception. But now, let's look at the code. I'm not just catching for the general exception, like we did before. We're looking for a number of exceptions. IO exception, not supported, directory not found, etc. There's a long list that we're trapping for. The specific exception that just occurred is an IO exception. And so we've caught that. And we're going to display that an I.O. error occurred. 
Okay, let's try a different example. Let's look for a file on a drive that doesn't even exist, the Z drive. Here we go. Now the exception that we're finding is directory not found. And we'll display that information. So a different type of exception, a different message. Finally, let's try a file on a drive that does exist, but the file itself doesn't exist. And now, we get a file not found exception. So three different examples, three different types of exceptions. Let's finish running this, exit the example, come in and take a closer look at this code. So the try tries to open the file. And then below that is a series of catch blocks looking for specific exceptions. And below that is a series of catch blocks looking for specific exceptions that could occur if this code doesn't work. Now how do we know what are the types of exceptions that could occur when we try and open a file? Well, we can see that in the documentation. Let's open the documentation for file.open. And this is in the .NET framework in the class library reference. Here are each of the namespaces in the framework. And in the system.io namespace, we're using the file class. There's a list of methods. And we're using the open method. And specifically, the open method where you pass the name of the file and the mode. If we scroll down through the documentation, we see not only how to use this method, but we also see a list of the exceptions that could occur. So the documentation for this method tells us the things that can go wrong. And we can then catch for any or all of these in our code. Now we want the more specific exceptions to occur at the top of the code and the more general ones to appear at the bottom because when an exception occurs, the .NET runtime will look in order of these catch blocks, and when it finds a match, it'll run that code. Well, how do we know which of these are more specific than the others? We can go back into the documentation, and for each of these exceptions, for instance, IO exception, look at the documentation for that, and see the inheritance hierarchy. So we can see that IO exception inherits from exception. Or let's look for unauthorized access exception. Let's go back in here and go back to unauthorized access exception and look at that. And see that that inherits from system exception, which inherits from exception. So we have a number of exceptions that we're catching for here. Watch what happens if we move the most general one to the top. Visual Basic warns us that each of these exceptions will never be reached because they all inherit from the general exception. Now it's going to let us do this. Let's run this code, and let's enter a file that doesn't exist. And now when we get into the catch block, the .NET runtime is looking in the order of the catch blocks and sees that this exception, which is a file not found exception, inherits from exception so there's a match, and the runtime runs the code in the catch. And re so we, we definitely want, want the more general, general catch.
down at the bottom. So what you've seen in this demo is that you can use multiple catch blocks to catch for specific exceptions and you can display a different message based on exactly what happened. In addition, the order you have your catch blocks matters. The more specific exceptions should be at the top and the more general ones should be at the bottom.